Sons Confederate Veterans meeting starts. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I salute the Confederate flag. I salute the Confederate flag with affection, reverence, and undying emotion to the cause for which it stands. And uh, thank all of you for being here today to witness this very important event. The event would not be possible without the support of many of you that are here and the citizens of White, Cumberland, Putman, and other surrounding communities. What is not possible in the interest of time for me to mention everyone who has made contributions to the return of this revolver, I would like to acknowledge at this time, especially the camps of the Sons of the Confederate Veterans and the United Daughters of the Confederacy, where they have contributed over $5,000 towards the return of this revolver. Thank you. In addition, I wanted to acknowledge a contribution by an anonymous donor who wished me to mention to you today is for his love of the South and to his appreciation of what General Dibrell did for the war, and you, the citizens of White County, who provided such a general to the war, he has given us $10,000. And yes, it's been cashed, and yes, it's good. <laughs> I might mention that was the last 10 to unransom this from the Connecticut and the Southerners. Down here to the South, we got it back. And that was our last $10,000 on it. At this time, I also want to recognize the descendants of General Dibro who are here today. And I want all of you, now all the rest of you, look around, raise your hand with all of you Dibro descendants. I want to tell you, there are still a lot. He added a lot of sons, and they're still here in town. Be sure to talk to them, okay? And in addition to that, thank you. In addition, I don't know where he got off to, but. Dr. Barnes is right over here. Hold your hand up, Dr. Barnes. I wanted to acknowledge him. He just is coming out of a hip problem. I'm amazed he's here today. Now, don't ask me about the facts and things. That man right there is one of the best authorities in Tennessee of Civil War items. And so if you've got any questions, you see him. <laughs> I told him today he makes me a little nervous he's here because now i got to hope my facts are all right. <laughs> I... I know there's many other important people here that I didn't mention, but because of the interest that we're all standing, I'm going to have to bite off on that and move ahead. Um, I did want to mention that a plaque is being made that will include the names of all who contributed $25 or more, and it will be on display down at the museum. And there's a number of people, and that's what we wanted. We did not want just one person stepping forward and giving this because it was given, and says right on the back strap, from the citizens and friends. And that's what we wanted, citizens and friends. And it worked out excellent. <coughs> okay, at this time I'd like to introduce Herb Sullivan, and many of you know Herb. He's the White County Executive, and I thought you might say a few words. Yeah, I'd just like to reiterate what Bill said. There's so many people here today that I can thank for helping get this. And, I, and I, I'd like to name them all, but I'm going to leave out some of them. We know how important this is to get this back home. Now, when I say get it back home, I mean get it back to the local area. 
Cumberland. It's not just as far as this is the upper Cumberland area because there's a lot of people here today that's in the upper Cumberland area and other places. And so to get it back in the south is the main thing when we get it back home. And uh, so I just want to thank everyone that's had any kind of part in getting this done and I want to thank you personally because it's a big thing for our area. Thank, thank you. Now I'd like to have Joey Savage come forth. He's from Dibro's camp locally and he's got a few words to say and before you say that I want to thank all of your men who are here and from other camps that are helping us celebrate this. If you go right ahead. I'd like to take this time to welcome citizens, friends, family, White County, all the state of Tennessee's came out today to celebrate this official homecoming of this 1851 Colt Navy Revolt. Without the support of everyone here, this would not have been possible. This revolver is probably most, one of the most pristine relics from the war between the states and all of the upcoming area, if not Middle Tennessee. If it could talk the stories it could tell. <laughs> it would tell us about being given to the Colonel after performing the 8th Tennessee Cav here in Sparta on September 4th, 1862. It would tell us about his first skirmish which took place at Neely's Bend, just above Nashville, October 15th, 1862. It would tell us about riding General Nathan Bedford Ford in the Battle of Parks Crossroads on December 31st of 1862, where Colonel Dibble started to gain recognition as a cavalry commander. He would tell us the stories of the Battle of Meredith Mill in Wildcat Creek, which took place not three miles from where we're standing today. On August the 17th of 1863, two days shy of 146 years ago. He would tell us about the Battle of Chickamauga, at which he could have fired some of the first shots of that battle on September 8th. 18th of 1863. He would tell us about the Colonel's promotion to Brigadier General only in July of 1864. He would tell us about the campaign in North Georgia, which took place from May to September of 1864, from Dalton, Resaca, Cartersville, New Hope Church, Kennesaw Mountain, and finally all the way to Atlanta. And finally, it would tell us about the fall of Richmond on April 3rd, 1865. General Dibble and his brigade ordered from Raleigh to Greensboro, North Carolina, where they were to report to President Jefferson Davis. They made the 85 mile march from Raleigh to Greensboro two nights and one day, and then escorted President Davis with all the archives of the Confederate States to Washington, Georgia, where they were captured, surrendered, and paroled on May 9, 1865. Friends, this Colt revolver is a piece of history. It's a piece of our heritage from a time that has long since passed and a time that does not need to be forgotten. It doesn't matter if your ancestors were Union or Confederate, Billy Yanks, Johnny Reeves, right or wrong, they fought for a cause they believed. They believed it just. And that's one thing that makes this country a great nation today. I would like to close with a quote from one of the 20th century greatest leaders. And I'd like for you all to think about this as you leave today. Sir Winston Churchill said, a nation that forgets its past has no future. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I'd like for Wallace Austin to come up and say a few words. Wallace is our director of our Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of our out-of-town guests. We certainly appreciate you being here. And I want to tell you that this breeze was ordered in your honor by oh. the Chamber of Commerce. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I, I just want to take a few minutes and thank Bill and Herb for all of their work, not only on getting the pistol, but starting the, our Heritage Museum. It's a great asset for this community. Great things don't just happen. Somebody has to work hard to make it happen, and they made it happen, and we really appreciate them for doing that. And any time that you can get a piece of your heritage brought back to bring in a tourist business to our community, that's a great thing. And thank you, Bill, and for all your hard work. Thank, thank you very much. much. And thank y'all again for being here. Unfortunately, Senator Burks just notified me that due to some issues that just came up, she couldn't make it today. But I am going to help go in a few words that she and I had talked about covering for her. <laughs> So I'm going to just take a moment here to go over these. 
and I think it will help you understand, and maybe many, I know some of you already know these facts, but I want to make sure that everyone understands the importance of this revolver and how it came to be. Because it really is divine intervention when you hear the whole story. The re this revolver was manufactured. If anyone ever manufactured something to be in the war, this is it. It was manufactured by Colt on April 3rd, 1861. And Colt has verified it was one of the last 25 revolvers that was sent south before the, uh, that was just before the war started. This was 10 days before Fort Sumter fell. And when Fort Sumter fell, Colt, in fact, Colt, if some of you study it, ended up being tried in, by Congress as being a traitor for sending these 25 guns. Colt wants this in their museum because it's the one of the only 25 that's ever come up. And they have all the serial numbers. So that's what makes that important. 147 years ago, right here, in next month, beginning of September, is when the 8th Tennessee Cavalry was formed, right over here. And this was presented by the same citizens that all of you are representing, right here, to General Deborah. But picture yourself 147 years ago. Nashville has just been taken over and occupied by the Yankees. The Yankees every day were sending out 25 to 30 forging parties. And some were reaching this far, and the forging party took everything. Your food. As one of my ancestors once said, you know, they were good about taking everything except something you had to work on the farm with. They didn't want to plow, they'd take the horse. They didn't want to work, they just took everything else and made sure we didn't have anything to eat or anything to plant with. Those were coming right here, so this was a threat. And I want to tell you, you would feel that today, whether no matter what side you were looking at, your world is about to change big time. And that's why you who have ancestors that went forth to help fight this war, that's the war that they were in. It was a war of occupation, and they were coming. And so that happened right here, right where you're standing. Then the rug revolver. Once they gave it to him, accompanied him throughout the war. We found notes about him talking about his personal revolver that was given to him. I want you to tell you the trials and tribulations this revolver and the 8th Tennessee Cavalry went through are well documented in a book entitled They Rode with Forrest and Wheeler by John Fisher. If I, some of you haven't read it, get one and read it. It is fabulous. If you want to know the Superman that went, what they went through, the starvation, the freezing, the no equipment, not knowing what tomorrow's gonna bring. Read that book and feel. It does a good job. We're gonna have a couple of those available next week down at the museum, but you can get them on the internet or anywhere else, but it's a great book. And no, we don't get any kickback from selling it. If you have not read this book, do it. It's important. At the conclusion of the war, as Joey just mentioned, General Dibberl and the 8th Tennessee Cavalry was escorting Confederate archives when they were captured in Georgia. As a part of their parole, General Dibberl was allowed to keep his revolver as it's inscribed in, you'll see that inscription when you come down to the museum after this, but it was inscribed to him, and the Iowa Cavalry unit that captured them put right on the parole papers that this was his personal property because his name was on it. Well, unfortunately, everybody had to go through Chattanooga after they were paroled after the war. And when the 8th Tennessee Cavalry went through Chattanooga, there's a 44th Indiana Regiment. And if some of you are from Indiana and know where Wabash is, you can find a lot of Confederate stuff because that unit had fought at Chickamauga before. And they said, it's payback time. Nobody comes out of here with their boots, their horses, or anything else. And they cleaned it. We did just recently find in the archives that four, four trains a day left Chattanooga carrying Civil War items to the north, to Wabash, on items that were taken. This revolver was one of them. I'm not going to take this time now <coughs> to go more about how that was all done. When you come down to the museum, there's free papers that tell you all the history of that part. 
So, but read that. You find out where it's been for 144 years. Basically, it's been two private people that had it. And they weren't about ready to show it to anybody. <laughs> and thank goodness the good Lord, and it was only through intervention of the Lord that we got this back. I want to note, though, it, that I received and show you something else how the world revolves kind of funny. I should know, be note that I received a call from Tom, Tom Lampiano, who owned this just before we did, telling me of this revolver being available for purchase exactly 144 years ago to the day that the parole officer indicated he took it away from General Deverell in Chattanooga. Now, that isn't a coincidence. So I knew at that time we were going to, I found out when I told Lapiano, he said, I can't give it to you, but I'll sell it to you for what I paid for it in 1989. And I didn't know much about revolvers then. I said, oh, that can't be too much. Fine, what is that? And he said, 122,000. Oh, I mean, sorry. 122,900. Well, he started off with 100,000. I said, no, 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 no. So 22,000 we finally hit on. And so I told him, I said, that's a lot of money. But we did find out afterwards that it sold in 1950 to an individual for $350, which was about the price of the car. And that was the only other time it had ever traded hands other than when Tony. It's only been sold three times. So, you know, we're very lucky when we got that bad. Um, Deverell, for those of you who don't know, his men had to end up walking, including the general, all the way back here. Many of them without their boots, because those boots were valuable at that time, and they took those away. So this revolver, being gone for 144 years, um, being possessed by two people, Colt said, you're very lucky. And they think it's one of the best preserved ones that has ever been around. It is completely fireable. Colt says in their letter, it could go through another war right now. I hope we don't need one, but it could. <laughs> meets all their specs. And they said it is amazing because these were interchangeable, but all the serial numbers on here match, which means it was all kept together. And they said that is, just doesn't happen. I want to mention that this time also, you'll get some breaking news here. Due to the generous support of a liberal family member, the museum now has on display the empty holsters, and they're symbolic being empty, because those are the exact empty holsters that this was in that Dibble brought home from Chattanooga, and they're on display. So when you get down there, thank you. When you get down there, you look at those. So for the first time in 144 years today, the holsters will be reunited with the pistol. So we are really going forward. Um, I want at this time, um, I'm going to have Joe Savage come up, because one of the things I want to, Joey, to do is demonstrate for some of you, we've had a lot of discussions on really how did these things fire and how did you have to get them ready for war. We're going to take just a minute to do that. Then before we go into closing, I want to make sure all of you know that thanks to the United Daughters, we have Tons of refreshments down at the museum. We're located you go two blocks over, one block south, and you'll be able to see there's all kinds of information down there that I don't want to bore you with today. And if you're looking for facts, that's where they are. Come in and see the museum, get some free refreshments. And oh, by the way, I'm supposed to say these caps. They're available down there, and also we have some limited shirts that are available down there. So when you go down, you can... Joey, we want to come up here and let's be educated. The now the revolver he's using is an exact duplicate of the one um, of the of the revolver that, uh, needless to say, we're not going to shoot a twenty-two thousand dollar revolver, <laughs> but uh, even though it would, but this is an exact duplicate. I'm going to have Joey show you the steps so you can appreciate what they had to do in those days to fire one of these things. 1851 Colt Knight. First off, you throw it to half cock. I left the cylinder. Being free. I don't have powder, so we would load it, but you can take a powder flask, pour the powder into the cylinder. And as it went around, you can use a patch and a ball. Put the patch and the ball there, bring it around, loosen the, 
in this piece, we push it down in there, and press the charge. At that time, we take the capper, cap, put on the end of it. Right, that was just the percussion cap. That was just percussion cap. That was just percussion cap. It'd be repeated six times. And it would take a good man probably three minutes to reload this stuff. They carried extra they carried extra cylinders for the ball. Any other questions? Yeah, any questions now? I this revolver that he just fired will be available down there. You can't handle the other one, but this is the exact weight, the same balance, everything. So if you want to feel how it feels to hold the other one, this is it. How much so did that one cost? That one's about $200, two dollars to three hundred. It's made in Italy and it's an exact reproduction. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What You're caliber so was it? You want to go ahead, Joey? This one is a forty-four. The original one is a thirty-six. Pretty good size bullet. Pretty, Pretty good size bullet. <laughs> Shoot around thirty grains of pound. I'm going to go at this time. I think that this is the important part. We'll get ready and we're going to present it. This is for what you all came here to see today. I want to present to Herd Sullivan, representing all of White County. And this revolver is being presented to White County for here forever. Hopefully, it'll never leave the county again, especially in time of war. But this revolver represents the heritage of all of you in the past and all of your children in the future. Okay. Joey is going to go ahead and get the cannons. If you want to turn around, you'll see the color, the color guard now firing. Okay. So if you you're, get over there and don't forget, there's refreshments down at the museum. So go on down there and see the refreshments. Thank all of you for coming today. Thank you. Guys.